Hey YouTubers, this is the Gold Standard Caesar 924 coming at you with another video for you guys today. So I just want to come up on here and just give you guys my thoughts concerning about WrestleMania 35. And overall, I gotta say, I was genuinely impressed by this show. I thought a lot of the marquee matches managed to deliver. Before I get into the main card, might as well just kind of go into detail regarding about the first two hours, that particularly being the kickoff show. So four matches were featured, and the first match that opened up the kickoff was the Cruiserweight title bout with the champion Buddy Murphy defending it against Tony Nese. Now, Tony managed to win a number one contenders tournament to earn a shot against Buddy Murphy, and he would go on to win the Cruiserweight title in the process. Then we have is the first out of the two battle royals in which Carmella won by eliminating Sarah Logan. The Raw Tag Team title bout with the Revival defending it against Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. So Ryder and Hawkins surprisingly beat the Revival in order to become the Raw Tag Team Champions. And the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal in which Braun Strowman ended up winning this year. So then we transition over into the main show. And surprisingly the first match that opened up the show was for the Universal title. Brock Lesnar going as the champion defending it against Seth Rollins. Now, prior to the match, we did get a bit of an opening segment in which Alexa Bliss, being the host of this year's WrestleMania, so she comes out there, she panders towards the fans and even trashes them in the process, but she does bring out a special guest with Hulk Hogan. So this is actually the first time we get to see Hulk Hogan in a WrestleMania ring in nearly five years. He does a bit of a callback to when he botched the location in which WrestleMania was being held. Like in WrestleMania 30, he said that it was held in the Silver Dome when it was actually the Super Dome. I did not actually catch this until I rewatched it again, but it turned out Hulk Hogan accidentally botched this year's uh, WrestleMania location, that being MetLife Stadium, in which he dubbed it the MetLife Center. So I thought that was pretty hilarious there. They ended up getting interrupted by Paul Heyman. So he comes out there and addresses that the Universal title match would say underway. Out comes his client Brock Lesnar coming out there. The champion, he's defending the belt. Seth Rollins, who won the 2019 Royal Rumble, would also come out. And just before Rollins would enter the ring, Lesnar attacks Rollins. There's a lot of brawl that ensues throughout the ringside. It took a little while for them to sanction the match right away. And the match actually was pretty much over before it began. Even though Lesnar pretty much had all the in on the offense. But it was only a matter of time before Rollins makes that one desperate move. And that happened to be a low blow in which the referee did not see. The complexion of the bout changes. Rollins takes advantage of this. He nails Brock Lesnar with three curb stomps to get the victory. So Rollins is now your universal champion. This crowd was really amped up. I thought this was a pretty smart decision to put this match at the very beginning of the show. And there's just so many other marquee matches that are featured on the show. And I think the, at this point, the universal title kind of feels like a bit of an afterthought. And given the situation with the WWE title bout with Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston, and then factoring in the announcement that the triple threat match for the women's title would be the main event of the show. It was a pretty smart move of them, to, the way that they kind of structured the card this year. And what a way to kick off WrestleMania by having Seth Rollins defeat the Beast in order to become the Universal Champion. So then we get to AJ Styles taking on Randy Orton. Now this was actually a match that I was definitely looking forward to. And this match was still pretty enjoyable, but... As far as being the greatest match of all time goes, that would kind of be an overstatement. There have been a lot of better matches out there in WrestleMania history over the years. But yeah, I definitely really enjoyed this match. And I know there were some folks that were complaining about the lighting. So basically the light was very bright when, they, when folks were attending WrestleMania Live. And that kind of took away the excitement of the match to an extent. Regardless, I mean, this match still pretty much delivered. And it started off with a bit of a more of a mat-based wrestling. 
and it kind of picks up, you know, like especially as the match goes along. Styles doing everything that he can to prevent Orin from countering his moves into an RKO. AJ Styles is kind of at a point where it really is showing that he's getting up there in age and he can't perform the way that he used to when he was in TNA. But, I mean, this match was still pretty enjoyable in its own way. It wasn't like the kind of match where a title a title is on the line to the point where the match has to deliver. Styles just came off of having one of the longest world title reigns in recent history. Some really cool stuff, and eventually Styles would defeat Randy Orton and win the match overall. The Fatal 4-Way match for the SmackDown Tag Team titles. The Usos going in the champions, taking on Ricochet and Aleister Black, Rusev and Shinsuke Nakamura, along with Sheamus and Cesaro. It was actually a pretty cool Tower of Doom spot with all the tag teams kind of doing their double team moves. One of the more notable spots I could remember vividly from that match was when Sheamus nailed the bro kick on Ricochet and the way that he sold that. Usos would go on to walk out of the match, still the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. Now, it's just really a shame, especially given Shinsuke being in the position that he's in now, compared to last year when he was fighting over the WWE title, and then a year later, all of a sudden, he's just teaming up with Rusev, and just seeing how relegated that he is compared to where he was the previous year, and now it's like, he just feels like a complete afterthought. And the same could apply with Asuka as well, because she was also in the main show last year. And now that she's been bumped to the pre-show, and then she came up short in that battle royal. Then again, she was supposed to defend the title, but until they did a bait and switch and had Charlotte beat Asuka to win that belt. This match definitely had its moments, and I definitely really enjoyed this match overall. Then we move on to the False Count Anywhere match between The Miz and Shane McMahon. Now, this actually was really enjoyable than it had every right to be. And I definitely really enjoyed the build-up. Shane McMahon befriends The Miz, and they form this sort of alliance. They would go on to win the tag team titles from the bar, but their title reign wouldn't last when they would drop it the following month to The Usos. Shane turns on The Miz. He even goes as far as ridiculing his father so this kind of builds into a match for wrestlemania this being a false count anywhere match so i definitely really enjoyed every moment of this bout and there was actually a pretty cool face off where the mrs father comes out from the crowd and just basically takes a stand against shane mcmahon the Miz is lying on the announce table despite his efforts shane mcmahon ended up getting the upper hand the Miz comes back to avenge his father, so this kind of saves way to ringside and over to the crowd. So there was just definitely a lot of back and forth that ensues, really reminding me of some of the moments that happened at WrestleMania 17 between Undertaker and Triple H, where they're also brawling mostly throughout the crowd. And they also did a pretty cool scaffold spot that they did, and... The Miz would execute the suplex, and they both fell from the top of the scaffold and landed on the crash pad. The match, while I admit the ending of it was a little bit questionable at best, because you were kind of expecting that the match might continue a little longer, but uh, Shane McMahon managed to get the pinfall over The Miz, like, barely since both men were down and out cold. It's likely that this feud is going to continue into the next pay-per-view. I definitely really enjoy what I've been seeing of Shane McMahon, especially now that he's turned heel and just basically kind of embracing a lot of the controversy that's surrounding between his conflict with The Miz and his father. So some pretty cool stuff that I've loved so far. And he's just basically just being full of himself and proclaiming himself to be the best in the world, considering that he won the best in the world tournament at the Saudi Arabia show. Definitely look forward to see what they'll do from here on out. Then we have is a fatal four-way match for the women's tag team titles. 
the Boston Hook connection, which is Sasha Banks and Bailey defending the belts against the Iconics. The Divas of Doom with Natalia and Beth Phoenix just coming out of retirement. And along with Tamina and Nia Jax. Now, this match was a step down from the SmackDown tag title match from earlier that night. But, I mean, this match wasn't bad either. I thought it was really cool to see Bret Hart accompany Beth Phoenix and Natalia. The iconic, surprisingly enough. Now, I thought for sure that they weren't going to win, but it turns out that they did. And they would go on to win the women's tag team titles. So, definitely be interesting to see what they'll do. And after watching a bit of a clip from uh, Monday Night Raw, so it seemed like after Alexa Bliss squashed Bailey, it seems like there's a chance that Bailey might be going over to SmackDown. I mean, now that she and Sasha Banks are no longer tag champions, so this kind of puts them in the position where they might split up. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. And obviously, Beth Phoenix and Tally weren't going to win as much as I would be open to see them win the tag titles. But, I mean, Beth Phoenix is only just back for a one-off match. The Iconics would go on to win the women's tag team titles. And then we get to, in my opinion, and perhaps a lot of people's opinions, that this was the match of the night. We have Dan O'Brien going as the WWE Champion, defending the belt against Kofi Kingston. So basically, this all kind of stems from Kofi's performance at the Elimination Chamber. This kind of got to a point where Kofi is striving to look for an opportunity to challenge the WWE Champion. So he's kind of put in these set of obstacles and a lot of the times he's put in these obstacles to the point where he's likely destined to fail. And he even ran the gauntlet on one of the episodes on SmackDown. And even though it looked like Kofi won the match, however, he had one more opponent to face, and that being the WWE Champion. So Kofi ended up coming up short. He was just completely exhausted. So then we get to the following week where Kofi will get one more opportunity. And this would be another gauntlet match, but this time Xavier and Big E tag team gauntlet match. And they would go on to win that gauntlet match to give Kofi that shot to face Dan O'Brien for the WWE title. Being Dan O'Brien that he's the submissionist that he is, he's going to do everything in his power to ensure that Kofi does not walk out of the match as the champion. So there was just a lot of uh, notable moments, especially when Dan O'Brien's locking in the LaBelle lock and Kofi's just doing everything he can to kind of fight it all off. A lot of that kind of ensues and the crowd was emotionally invested in this match you could really tell from their reaction that they they were universally behind Kofi which is very ironic because five years prior people were universally behind Daniel Bryan in his situation there's just a lot of really cool callbacks that they did with Daniel Bryan it's like Bryan mentioning how Kofi's a b-plus player and that he can't win the big one which is very ironic because Stephanie, I believe Stephanie or Triple H made mention about Brian being a B-plus player at one time. And now it seems like that's something that Daniel Bryan has since inherited. So I also really love what they've been doing. I think this was like the probably one of the best builds of this entire WrestleMania build. There's just a lot of suspense. Brian doing the walls of Jericho, even though they just refer to it as a Boston Crab. But it was basically the walls of Jericho that Jericho had been known for doing. And I know Jericho's been kind of blacklisted by WWE as of now. There was just some pretty cool stuff where it, it just kind of feels like maybe Kofi might not win this. And yeah, you know, I was just like on my feet just watching it as a viewer at home. Kofi did manage to hit Brian with the Trouble in Paradise. Gets that one, two, three. Crowd just goes massively insane. Kofi Kingston becomes the WWE Champion. As a matter of fact, the first African-American WWE Champion in the company's history. This was just a really great match. And there's just a lot of emotional investment that was involved. Definitely really glad for him. He's definitely come a long way. It's been over 11 years since he made his debut. And just kind of going through all the challenges that have been thrown in his path over the years. It'll be interesting to see what they'll do from here. But I'm definitely really glad to see Kofi win the big one 
All right, so coming off the heels of that intense WWE title match, we do, however, move on to the United States title as Samoa Joe defends his belt against Rey Mysterio. Now, this was actually over before it began, and Samoa Joe just completely decimates Rey in short order for him to retain the U.S. title. Now, this match was one of the WrestleMania matches I was actually looking forward to, and you would think on paper that the idea of Joe versus Mysterio would have been the kind of match that would have stole the show. And going back to what I was saying in my predictions video when I was discussing a brief bit about Joe versus Mysterio and how much of a dream match that could have been some 10 years ago, but now you got these two wrestlers that are past their prime and mysterious issues with his knee getting the better of him. It's actually pretty ironic the more I think about it because 10 years ago at WrestleMania 25, Rey Mysterio beat JBL in about the same length as what you saw with Joe and Mysterio. And he ended up retiring JBL. And the same thing kind of happened with Mysterio here. Joe ended up retaining the title. And, you know, one of those matches that even on paper, you would think, wow, you know, th these two guys, just to see like their certain wrestling styles just kind of blend together, you know, just to see the powerhouse wrestler taking on the fast paced underdog, something to that effect. We got what we got here and Joe ended up defeating Rey Mysterio to retain his title. And then we get to Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre. This is Roman Reigns' first pay-per-view match in a singles competition. This match was kind of suffering through the burnout from that intense WWE title match. Now this match wasn't all by means the worst match on the card. It was still coming off the heels of Kingston versus Bryan. So I guess I could kind of cut them some slack. Roman and Drew basically going back and forth at it, and Roman would go over Drew McIntyre. I know people have their opinions on Roman Reigns, what's there to be said. It's really not worth bitching about. I have all the respect for Joe, the person portraying the Roman Reigns character. And granted, I did have my problems with Roman over the years, but hopefully McIntyre bounces back from this. Maybe now with the Superstar shakeup coming up, so maybe they'll have him move to SmackDown and maybe get a fresh start there. And then we have is the No Holds Barred match between Triple H and Batista. This would be the first match in 14 years that they actually fought one-on-one. -on -one. They did, however, fought at another WrestleMania at 21 where Batista beat Triple H to win his first world title. And now we fast forward 14 years later. Batista makes his surprise comeback by attacking Ric Flair backstage. He demands a challenge against Triple H, bringing up some of their history, being part of Evolution, and just basically exposing Triple H and all the BS that he's put Batista through over the years and that he was only in it for himself, that Evolution was really more about Triple H maintaining his relevance his status as a top guy in the company and now that he's the COO he's definitely a lot more in charge now with the WWE now that he just wants this opportunity to face Triple H in this no holds barred match when I was watching the infamous Batista promo where he just demanded Triple H to give him what he wants and it just became like this meme that just ended up going viral and just one of those really crummy promos that it just comes off very laughable as opposed to really trying to take Batista as a serious competitor. So there was just some aspects about that build that just kind of soured it for me. Not saying Batista's like that bad of a promo guy because he can cut pretty good promos. In terms of the build up there was just it, it was just left to be desired but you know, he gets this one last match, gets his last hurrah here. Triple H did announce that he would put his career on the line if he were to lose this match. Which is very uh, ironic because six years ago, he actually put his career up on the line against Brock Lesnar at the very same pay-per-view, at the very same stadium that he put his career on the line against. So that was just kind of very 
weird timing, I guess, or coincidental timing. Whatever the case is, fact is that Triple H decided to put his career up on the line. This match did have its moments, but there were a lot better matches on WrestleMania here. But there was a table spot that wasn't really much of a table spot since the table didn't completely collapse. Triple H did a spear on Batista through the opposite announce table across from the Spanish announce table. And there was just a couple near falls. But Triple H would manage to get the comeback, hit Batista with the pedigree for the three count. So Triple H's wrestling career is still intact. And Batista quietly has his last hurrah. Because the next night he announced on Twitter that he would be officially retired. Now he didn't say pro wrestling, but he just said sports entertainment. This match, they made the most of what they had to do. Now, I guess a minor nitpick I had is the fact that even though Triple H's career is on the line, but Batista, given that for years that he said that he wanted to have his last match, especially being Triple H, so logically I would figure that maybe they would have done a double retirement match, sort of like what they did with Warrior and Savage from WrestleMania 7. So I figured they could have gone in that scenario where both of their wrestling careers would be online, but it just turns out that it was only just Triple H's, but... He managed to go over in this bout, and Batista would announce that he would be officially be retiring from professional wrestling altogether. Triple H ended up retaining his career, I mean, even though he doesn't really wrestle as much anymore. So then we get to Kurt Angle versus Baron Corbin. This would be Angle's farewell match. And this wasn't this match didn't really last very long. I mean, I think a lot of folks going into this match thought that, you know, this would be a dud. And it turned out that it was. But thankfully, it didn't go on for too long, necessarily. Corbin did, however, go over Kurt Angle in the spout. And, you know, Angle managed to thank the WWE Universe for all of his contributions that he's given to them over the years. All the laughter all the emotions and all the star-studded matches to kind of putting his heart and soul on the line, doing what he loves to give back to the fans. This match, you know, was pretty underwhelming way to kind of end Kurt Angle's career. A lot of people wanted to see him fight John Cena, but we didn't get that. Speaking of John Cena, I almost forgot to mention that there was actually a segment during Elias's guitar session. It turns out that, you know, John Cena made his unannounced appearance. He came back as the doctor of thugonomics. His uh, rap gimmick that really helped him get to where he is today, that gimmick alone. Uh, just reminding me back of middle school where Cena would always doing those traditional freestyle raps. He would always come out to like these uh, like sports jerseys and having all these baseball caps on so uh, in this case being that this is New York so he was coming out with the New York Yankee shirt he had that silver steel chain that he used to wear so it was a really great moment just to see Cena kind of go back to that gimmick I believe this was the first time he's came back to that gimmick since 2012 when he did that freestyle rap on The Rock leading into WrestleMania 28 but yeah, so we actually see Cena come back here and having his confrontation with Elias and even giving him the attitude adjustment. But really back in the day when it used to be called the FU. So I might as well just say John Cena hit Elias with the FU. Really great to see him there. Just kind of reminding me back to being in grade school once again. Definitely really glad to see Cena there. Uh, really disappointed that we didn't really get to see him in a wrestling match, but, you know, given that Cena's more focused in terms of his acting career's concerns, I guess I could understand why Cena hasn't been wrestling a whole lot and why they didn't have him wrestle in a marquee match. So his significance in WWE has gradually dwindled over the years, and it definitely shows now here in 2019. But, you know, he's definitely getting up there in age, but, you know, he's definitely moving on to potentially bigger projects. Wish him the best in all his future endeavors, even though he's still under contract with WWE, technically. He's very loyal to the business. I'm definitely glad to see him come back under that persona and just bring back some good old nostalgia there.
And then we have is Bobby Lashley defending his Intercontinental title against Finn Balor. Now, it's not just plain old Finn, but rather the demon persona of Finn Balor that we haven't seen since SummerSlam. So he makes his appearance. Not a very long match. Balor defeats Bobby Lashley in order to regain his Intercontinental title. This match was just kind of whatever, but it wasn't like terrible or anything like that. And now we get to the anticipated main event, and this is for the Raw and SmackDown Women's title. So we have over on Raw, the Women's Champion there being Ronda Rousey, and on SmackDown, uh, Charlotte Flair, who won the belt from Asuka from, on an episode of SmackDown, and as well as the Women's Royal Rumble winner of 2019 being Becky Lynch. I definitely really enjoyed this match. Maybe not as much as Kofi and Brian, surprisingly. But I mean, this match was definitely been the most anticipated. Even though the build-up was all over the place. Even though Becky won the Women's Royal Rumble. But at some point she got injured. Charlotte ended up taking over as the number one contender by default. So then they did a situation at Fastlane between Becky and Charlotte that the winner of the match or especially in this case with Becky Lynch that if she were to beat Charlotte she would be reinserted into the woman's title bout between Ronda and Charlotte and so Ronda's interference she ends up attacking Becky Lynch getting that DQ for Becky to be reinserted into this woman's title bout so thus making this a three-way. So yeah, I definitely really had a blast watching this match. The entrance, they had Charlotte come out to that helicopter, paying homage to her father, uh, going back, I believe, going back to the first Great American Bash, where Ric Flair also came out to a helicopter as well. I thought that was pretty cool. Something we haven't seen in WWE, but it's something that we've seen in WCW a couple times. I think Sting also had a helicopter entrance when they were doing an episode on Nitro at Panama Beach during the, their annual spring breakouts that they used to do. So there were a couple occasions WCW did the helicopter entrance. For WWE, it's one of those... I think this might have been the first time that they've done a helicopter entrance in WWE. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that this was probably the first in my mind in WWE that they've done a helicopter entrance for a wrestler and in this case being charlotte i definitely really enjoyed this match and the ending i have questions with that as well because i believe ronda was trying to go for her arm bar and then like becky countered it into like a crucifix roll up and ronda's shoulders were sorted down but not really and it just came off really awkward just watching it from that angle and the way that Becky was doing the crucifix roll. And that might be also the referee's fault since he kind of made that count. The ending of the match did kind of feel pretty anticlimactic. I thought for sure that maybe Becky would have either had Ronda or Charlotte submit to the disarm bar you know we got what we got here and it seemed like you know Becky was intended to win this match just definitely a really fun match here overall despite the ending and Becky Lynch would walk out as both the Raw and Smackdown Women's Champions so that's really all I have to say about the Wrestlemania 35 just a really fun show overall I mean, the first three hours, I think, were the best parts of the show. Even though the Fatal 4-Way Women's Tag Title Bouts was likely the worst out of the bunch. But even that match uh, it was pretty passable. I know some people had issues with the lighting when it came to Randy Orton versus AJ Styles. Even some of the stinkers, especially after the WWE title bout. Corbin versus Angle being like the worst match on the card. Triple H Batista was what it was given their ages. Roman and Drew was just kind of there as well. But yeah, everything else was pretty consistently great in my opinion. I wouldn't rank it as the greatest of all time. That might be pushing it. But it was definitely one of the more historic uh, WrestleMania events in recent history. Probably the best one in my opinion since 30. Some might say 31, but that could be debated, even though the build-up wasn't really all that great, but ended up 
surprising a lot of people. Now, overall, I definitely enjoyed WrestleMania 35 much better than last year's. Even though I wasn't as harsh about 34, the more I start to think about it, I could understand why some folks didn't like the previous year's WrestleMania, especially like the very end of the show and the main event with Brock and Roman wasn't really all that and that ended up stinking up the joint. 35 was just all around just a step up from last year's. That's really my thoughts about this year's WrestleMania overall. So let me know what your guys thoughts are in the comment section below. What were some of your favorite matches? What were some of your favorite moments? Feel free to comment in the comment section below. I would like to hear you guys thoughts. Thank you all guys for watching and until next time this is the gold standard user 924 signing out.